Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Well, my name is uh, Gary Bjorgi. I'm uh, an instructor at uh, CSI in uh, Planned General Staff College. And uh, this is our lesson on the uh, Korean War, 1950 to 1953. Uh, with me today are uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Colonel Jim Martin and uh, Dr. Larry Yates, uh, both from uh, Combat Studies Institute. We're going to be uh, uh, talking uh, about the Korean War and uh, raising some issues that hopefully will uh, help you in your preparation uh, for teaching the course, uh, teaching the lesson. Uh, before we get into the uh, uh, meat of the, uh, of the lesson, I would just like to mention that there are a number of uh, U.S. Army official publications that deal with the Korean War. We have uh, this uh, combat uh, action in Korea by uh, Geigler. We have a number of uh, publications, uh, books printed by Center of Military History. Uh, here's uh, Ebb and Flow, November 1950, July 1951, uh, Policy and Direction the first year, and then uh, south to the Naktong, uh, north to the Yalu, and also uh, the Medics War. And I think, Jim, you had another book. Uh, yeah, there's a brand new book out the Center of Military History has just put out called Black Soldier, White Army that deals with uh, the 24th Infantry Regiment in Korea, which is a, is a change from what you'll find in these books and how they've dealt with that regiment. So if you want an update, uh, the, the issue really here is one of race, uh, segregation and prejudice. And if you want an update, the new one, Black Soldier, White Army, from the Center for Military History, updates what's in the Apple books. A couple here. Um, this book is from the Foreign Relations of the United States series. There are a series of volumes. There is one volume for Korea 1950, and they can, uh, and then another volume for 51, and I believe uh, a third volume for 52 through 54. So it would be three volumes that cover the war years. Uh, and what they contain are declassified documents, uh, mainly at the policy-making level, but they do get into military affairs. So for example, in the 1950 Korea volume, you'll find uh, the Pentagon's orders to General MacArthur in Korea, etc. So uh, if you uh, have access to a university, uh, government uh, documents department, uh, or uh, I don't know, public library, whatever, you might see if these are available. One other book just came out, John Lewis Gaddis, we now know. Um, Oxford University Press, but it's available commercially uh, in most bookstores or, and, or it could be ordered. But it uh, deals with uh, 
documentation we've gotten out of Moscow and Beijing since uh, the end of the Cold War, and I guess some of it was coming out even before the end of the Cold War, but uh, Chapter 3 deals with Asia, and it uh, brings us up to date on what we know now from the other side's point of view as to how the war started and then various critical points in the war, such as the Chinese intervention. What were their, were their considerations? Uh, what was Stalin saying to Mao? What was Mao saying to Kim Il-sung? What was Kim saying to both of them? Uh, Gaddis gives you an overview of that in this book. Yeah, thank you. There, there are uh, quite a number of books that have been written on the Korean War. The war itself, uh, some people have called it uh, the Forgotten War. Um, Perhaps some of you have had the opportunity to uh, visit the uh, Korean War Monument in Washington, D.C., which uh, is uh, just south of the uh, uh, reflecting pool there in front of the Lincoln uh, Memorial, opposite the uh, Vietnam Memorial. Certainly the number of casualties in the, in the Korean War uh, make it uh, a war that uh, should not be forgotten. Approximately 54,000 American, uh, uh, Americans died uh, in the war and uh, over a million and a half uh, Korean civilians and uh, about 800,000 uh, uh, Korean uh, soldiers uh, north and south. It was uh, fought by as many as uh, eight U.S. divisions at one time uh, in Korea and uh, it's uh, it has some very interesting characteristics, and if we go back and look at it in terms of its place in the evolution of modern warfare, it also uh, has a very uh, special role, a uh, very special place, I think, uh, in terms of it being the first limited war that the U.S. Uh, fought after the, uh, the great victory in World War II. And uh, so now, as a just to start off here, uh, talking about the, uh, the war and, uh, and what are the lessons that we can draw from the war, I think the first place uh, to start here is to just look at where the war uh, fits into the international environment at that time and the, uh, and the U.S. policies. Uh, where, what was the United States national security position? What were our policies in early 1950? Where did we... Uh, see the problems uh, uh, in the world and and did we did we think that there was going to be a war in Korea I guess certainly that that is uh, is also a, a major issue because a lot of people um, or very few people thought that there would be a war in Korea and and that we are, we were caught by uh, surprise you know, that's a point I, I teach an elective on the Korean War and it's a point that surprises my students when we talk about how this really started because you don't think about how this war comes about. What most of us have read about is all of a sudden North Koreans come across the border. But the fact is that as the U.S. is focusing in the post-World War II era, uh, they're not focusing on, on China and they're not focusing on Korea. I mean, there's the discussion of, of you know, they lost China. Uh, the revolution has occurred in China and uh, Taiwan is now where the nationalists are. And the Secretary of State gives a speech at the press club in which he draws a line which shows American interests uh, in the Pacific. And that line includes Japan, but it doesn't include Korea. Okay, it doesn't put Korea within our sphere. And I think you can argue that that, that sends a message uh, to the North Koreans and their uh, their Russian friends, all right, that it's acceptable to the United States. Okay, and I think that's one of the backgrounds you've got to place when you want to start looking at the at why this war comes about in the international, you know, the overall international context, is that we send a very muddled message uh, to the communist bloc nations that we have no problem with them taking Korea. What do you think, Larry? We've pretty well written off Korea as being strategically important. And Atchison's speech, although it's aimed at 
Taiwan, it does reaffirm that by leaving Korea on the other side of the defensive perimeter as well. Uh, and there, as you suggested, there's conflict already in Korea. Uh, both sides want to reunify the uh, peninsula. Kim Il-sung, the communist leader of the North, Sigmund Rhee, um, He's not our puppet by any means, we can't manage him, but he's uh, someone we've turned to, a nationalist, uh, some would say a rightist, uh, who wins elections, sets up a fairly dictatorial government in the South. Both of them, are, uh, Kim Il-sung and Sigmund Rhee, are committed to re reunifying the country. The demarcation there across the 38th parallel was an administrative convenience done in 45 when the Soviets came into the northern part uh, in the latter part of the Pacific War. And, to compensate, we go into the southern part of Korea. But Korea, uh, like Vietnam, was not naturally divided. Uh, it was an administrative line that became then a political line in the Cold War. And uh, both sides are committed to reunifying the country. Uh, but Sigmund Rhee can't get the U.S. support to do it because we don't consider it to be that significant. And uh, Kim Il-sung is having a tough time getting Stalin to approve an invasion of the South. So what you have in the peninsula is guerrilla warfare, and, uh, raids and intrusions across the, the, 50, or the 38th parallel. You've got guerrilla warfare in the south, which the south manages to deal with fairly well. Uh, and so it, uh, it becomes apparent to Kim Il-sung that if he's going to reunify the country, it better be through an invasion. And the problem is getting Stalin to buy off on it. Well, after Acheson's speech, after uh, China goes communist, then Acheson's speech, uh, Stalin's much more adventurous than he was uh, up to 1950. And he uh, uh, seems to be more willing to take the risk. Uh, as Again, the archives, more recent, uh, or as fi findings in the uh, Russian archives have indicated. And uh, so uh, 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 what Gaddis argues is then that Stalin, Kim Il-sung, and Mao uh, do the one thing that would ensure a U.S. response, and that is open aggression uh, across the 38th parallel. Had they continued with guerrilla warfare, we probably wouldn't have done anything. Uh, had it been raids, whatever, we wouldn't have done anything. But when you committed the open aggression, it was the one thing that was sure to get a response because of the Munich analogy. Uh, uh, going back to how did World War II start? We didn't stop Hitler soon enough. And uh, 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 the, the appeasement of Munich is the uh, lesson for that. So the Munich analogy, Truman uses it after the North Koreans attack. Uh, uh, he refers to what happened in Munich and we need to resp respond this time or they will attack us elsewhere, primarily Europe or the Near East, in areas that are vital to our interest. Uh, so you've got the Munich analogy. Uh, also, it's a test for the United Nations. Uh, Truman cites that as a reason we have to respond. Uh, and also, it, it has an effect on the Japanese. Overt aggression in Korea uh, cannot be ignored by Japan. And we're in the process of, one, signing a peace treaty with Japan, and two, uh, a defense pact. And if we don't show resolve in Korea, the Japanese are going to have serious doubts about allying themselves with the United States. So for these reasons, the uh, North Korean attack in South Korea precipitate the response that Kim Il-sung promised Stalin would not take place, and that is a U.S. military reaction. And I think a point you made there is important. While Korea and Formosa were not within the line we drew, uh, Japan certainly is. Oh, yeah. Japan is a strategic, of in, strategic importance to us. And if you've ever been to Korea, you recognize that it, it points like a dagger right at Japan. I mean, what are you, an hour away by flying time? Less than that. During the Korean War, you'll have Air Force fighters coming off of Japan flying strike missions in Korea. Mm -hmm. It's that close. So if you're going to protect Japan, you can't just give up Korea uh, to the communist forces. So it, it becomes important to us because of the proximity to right. Japan. Yeah. Really and, the, and the issue here of the Japanese psychology, uh, I mean, it's, it's very easy uh, you know, to think well, we're not going to get involved on the mainland of Asia and, and, and all of that. But once we actually are faced with the fact that here is a, an invasion of Korea, when we've had the containment uh, strategy, 
the Truman Doctrine, in fact, uh, years before, uh, sending aid to Greece and Turkey. And then all of a sudden, here's this actual armed invasion that's going to expand the uh, area under communist control. We have to do something, and as you, as you said, looking at Korea as a dagger pointing at Japan, this was the strategic mindset within Japan that led Japan to try to gain control uh, over Korea in the late 19th century and eventually annex Korea in 1910 for, the, for Japan's security, national security. They wanted control of Korea. Well, if we would, to, would have let the communists take over, you know, in June of 1950, you know, the psychological impact in Japan would have been tremendous. Yeah, that's yeah. something that both, both uh, Larry and Gary said. Um, you know, Gary talked about containment, and Larry talked about how the overt uh, military actions what brought our response. And Gary talked about containment. I mean, containment is the dominant theme in our foreign policy uh, in 1950. Mm -hmm. And when, when the North Koreans, supported by, you know, their T-34 Russian tanks, throw it out just right in the world's face, uh, it obviously becomes an issue of containment. I mean, it is communism spilling over. When you see a T-34 tank, it is therefore communism, because that's a Russian tank and right. you know it's a Russian tank. In line with that, uh, and again, this may be part of the Cold War lesson, or you might want to use it now or not at all, but uh, uh, in early 1950, or the, by the spring of 1950, you have a reassessment of containment policy in the form of National Security Council Paper 68, or NSC 68. And NSC 68 identifies international communism as the threat, not Soviet, simply Soviet expansion, which it had been before. It's now international communism. So like you say, when you see Russian tanks and uh, 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 Korean communists coming across the parallel, it's a part of an international movement as we see it. Uh, it may not be monolithic. We still hope there are fissures between the Russians and the Chinese, but it appears as though they are, at least in this case, acting in concert as they are. The documents demonstrate that now, uh, and uh, that uh, we cannot ignore the threat. But again, uh, it's uh, the U.S. response is based based upon several points, which I think uh, we've touched upon them all, but to summarize, the Munich analogy, if we don't respond, they will hit us elsewhere. They will, they will only encourage them to do more in the Near East or in Europe, or our real interest are in Europe. Uh, also, it will hurt Japan, uh, the psychological effect on Japan. We cannot allow that to happen. It's a test of the UN and collective security. And at this point, the UN is still seen as, uh, uh, or there's still hope for the UN uh, to perform the role that uh, we had envisioned for it as helping to maintain the peace. Uh, uh, so, uh, in this Cold War context, you can't, uh, what was a non-strategic area all of a sudden becomes a major interest. It's not a vital interest. We're not going to fight to the death of Fort, and there are times where re we're ready to get out. Uh, it, but it's no longer a peripheral interest over which we have no interest, which it was before June of 1950. It's somewhere in between. One historian has called, called it a major interest. We'll fight to uh, uh, save the South Korean regime, at least that's the initial objective. We'll get to war objectives uh, later. But uh, we'll fight for South Korea to a certain degree. If we get pushed off, well, we'll reassess it then. But there, and there are indications that if we had been pushed out, we probably, probably would have accepted it. But we don't know. That's speculation. Well, thinking about the motivations then uh, for uh, getting involved in Korea and the decision to intervene, uh, as has been mentioned, here are all these reasons to intervene. Then the question is, well, uh, what are we going to intervene with? Uh, what tools do we have uh, to use uh, to serve our national policy objectives here? And uh, the unfortunate uh, reality is that uh, we have an unprepared uh, military. Uh, the Army is unprepared, the Navy is unprepared, the Air Force is unprepared for this, uh, for the, to fight this war. And what does that mean then for the soldier uh, who's sent off to, uh, to fight the North Koreans? It's going to mean trouble. And 
uh, we have Task Force Smith then, which has been used uh, ever since the Korean War as an example of unpreparedness, the hollow army, uh, you know, forcing the army to, uh, forcing the soldiers uh, to get into a dangerous situation because the, uh, the government did not provide them the uh, training, preparation, equipment, uh, whatever, the numbers that uh, would allow them to go and, uh, and win that first battle. And this is a spin-off of the last lesson. It, Larry talks about that, the Cold War lesson, and this is a very tightly tied lesson to that one. Because, I mean, the reason that we have this hollow army that Gary talks about is because, you know, our, our national military uh, strategy is really wrapped around the bomb. It's wrapped around that huge advantage that we have in nuclear weapons. And so the individual soldier, the tank, does not deliver that weapon. So the money's not put into the Army. The money gets put into those portions of the Air Force which can deliver nuclear weapons. Well, so while we have an Air Force with plenty of money, uh, it's not putting that money into close air support uh, that can help on the battlefield, and we'll see that in the initial fight in Korea. The ability to bring close air support down for, for infantry armor uh, units simply does not exist early on because that's not where our defense dollars are going. So we have an army that still basically has World War II weapons, which are not well maintained and cared for, and who've not had the money to do the training, the units in Japan, uh, the money or the space to do the individual unit training. And while they may be able to fire their rifles, rifle marksmanship's easy, but any of you who've tried to do uh, maneuvers at the company level, the battalion level, the brigade level, or the division level, know that those are things you have to practice. They don't just come naturally because you teach a soldier how to shoot. And, and that's the result, really, of our national military objectives and the way we focus where we're going to spend our money. And adding to that, um, you've got the issue of the budget. The idea of a balanced budget uh, as a political issue is nothing new. Uh, it's in today's news, of course, but uh, Truman was committed to balancing the budget uh, because if you don't have it, you're going to have runaway inflation. You can ruin the economy and lose the Cold War right there, a theme that Eisenhower will come back to uh, after the Korean War uh, uh, when he's president. But uh, uh, the need to balance a budget, a military strategy based on the bomb, uh, and uh, among the services, the uh, preference for the Air Force over the other two, the Air Force, which we haven't discussed becomes a separate service in what, 1947? Um, and I assume that's part of the Cold War lesson, the National Security Act of 47 and all of that. But uh, these considerations are at play, budgetary as well as strategic. You know, I think this all rolls in because you talked about the decision to intervene and that's where we really got started. And, and we've talked about how the decision by the North Koreans to come across in, in a blatant uh, invasion is really what will garner the response. The problem then becomes on the decision to intervene is, okay, what do I intervene with? Mm -hmm. uh, that becomes the real issue. We have, what, just over two divisions, rather hollow divisions in uh, in Japan, four. we have four there. Yeah, with the whole army, the whole army has ten divisions. Four are in Japan, and I think uh, in the uh, reading that's you know assigned for this lesson out of Wigley, Wigley does a good job of uh, talking about the accident of geography that puts forty percent of our divisions within uh, you know an hour's flying time or two hours flying time of the uh, Korean Peninsula. And, and you know what's interesting is though we've got 40 percent there, when the president makes his decision to go ahead and say, okay, yeah, General McCarthy, anybody under your command, you can commit. The problem is, well, we send, we send Brad Smith and Task Force Smith, but how many anti-tank rounds do they take with them? They take six. Mm -hmm. And what is that? Half of what's in the Far East Theater? So while we have 40% of our divisions an hour away, there's no ammunition to stop tanks. Uh, you know, one comment I'd like to make here, most students who haven't looked into this war much, uh, 
envision the North Korean forces as being just like the Chinese forces, which will cross the Yalu. Those are infantry heavy, mass wave assaults, and that's not accurate. The columns which will shred Task Force Smith and will run the Americans back into the Pusan perimeter are tank heavy. They are being pushed forwards on the roads behind T-34 tanks. I mean, that's what shreds Task Force Smith is the T-34s yeah. and their inability to even dent them or slow them down. Yeah. Then, so there, there's a misunderstanding there, and you need to make sure your students yeah. understand that. It's two different types of ground war. The first one is, is a tank battle, or infantry trying to take on tanks. Later at the Yalu, yes, it will be wave after wave, mass assaults of Chinese infantrymen. But that's not true when the North Koreans come across. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, um, you know, how could that happen, you know, given the... Uh, intelligence devices, surveillance devices we have today, it's, uh, you can't imagine to, uh, an opponent that easily massing armor without us knowing about it. Well, we didn't have those things back then. And it was just generally assumed by the uh, Korean military advisory group that we left behind when uh, U.S. occupation troops pulled out in 49. Uh, the K-MAG, as it was called, uh, the, the, uh, the general that led that, and I don't recall his name, but his assumption was that you cannot use T-34s in Korea. Uh, the terrain is too rugged for their use. Well, uh, the North Koreans proved him wrong, and it, it proved catastrophic because on the basis of that assumption and others, the United States had not supplied Sigmund Rhee with tanks that could be used against tanks, with aircraft that could be used against tanks, or with artillery, or heavy artillery. The reason being is if we gave him those things, our assumption was he'd go north with them and precipitate his own war. So we withheld the heavy weaponry that he could have used against tanks on the assumption that the other side couldn't use tanks, and the assumption was wrong. And here they come, and as Jim said, what is our response? And one thing to keep in mind, it is incremental. We don't immediately com commit Task Force Smith. Truman meets Saturday night, Sunday, or excuse me, Sunday at uh, Blair House with his advisors, and the initial response is air cover for uh, the South Koreans and our advisors. Then it's air and naval support south of the 38th parallel. Then it's air and naval support north of the 38th parallel. U.S. aircraft and naval vessels in the vicinity taking part. And finally, by the end of that week, uh, with the realization that the air and naval power are unable to stop the North Koreans by themselves, the decisions made to send in land troops, Task Force Smith being the first contingent to arrive. And uh, uh, it's legend lives on. You know, my students are absolutely amazed when we do the, the, the piece on Task Force Smith. And uh, I have a copy of a letter that Brad Smith wrote some years ago to a CGSC student and talks about how, well, you know, they did the best they could with what they had. And my students keep going, how could any American commander send a, a thrown together battalion task force with six anti-tank weapons, a few howitzers, uh, you know, hadn't trained together at all, and throw them up against armored columns. It's unconscionable. But I think the fact of the matter is that the guy who saw Brad Smith off at the airport basically told him, Brad, just go show the flag. When they see the Americans are there, they'll stop. Okay. And, you know, we consistently uh, underestimate, I think, our enemies in the Far East. Uh, we'll see it again in the Vietnam lesson. And we believe that if we showed the American flag, Brad Smith stood up there with his helmet on, looked like a GI, they'd go, oh, the Americans are here, let's turn around and go back. And the North Koreans had no intention of slowing down for Americans. And I think that's, that's to me, that's the only uh, answer that makes any sense as to why you send Task Force Smith. Mm -hmm. Because you don't think they're really gonna have to fight it out. You're not sacrificing American bodies. You're doing a show of force, and that's all it's going to take for these guys to go back north again. It's one thing to take on the South Koreans. It's a never totally different thing to take on American soldiers. 
and it, just so we're clear, uh, uh, we don't seem in conflict. Again, Kim Il Sung is not expecting the Americans to intervene. But once they do, he's already started his juggernaut. He's not going to call it to a stop. Uh, he's going to, at the, if need be, he'll look to the Chinese and Russians for more support. Uh, but that comes down the road. But uh, he does not expect the intervention. Uh, but when he sees the flag, he doesn't turn it around. Uh, he it keeps going. The momentum is there. But again, both sides have mis, uh, uh, interpreted the other's intentions. Uh, they've misgaged the other, and they're both going to pay for. Well, this issue of what's, uh, what is or is not uh, un unconscionable, as we look at what happens to the uh, 24th Infantry Division, uh, basically, uh, I think General Walker uh, was uh, prepared to sacrifice that division to gain time because he knew that he had to somehow gain enough time to set up the Pusan perimeter. And uh, the, uh, the division is pretty well smashed uh, as, it, as it does withdraw from that early, early July uh, up there by uh, Osan uh, down through Tate, uh, uh, was it Tate John and then Tate Gu uh, and, and so on. Uh, finally, we're in the Pusan perimeter and that area has been reinforced then uh, and eventually there are 100,000 troops that are in the Pusan perimeter and then um, MacArthur is, uh, is thinking well uh, I guess uh, we're not going to fight this out in the Pusan perimeter I'm going to take a strategic uh, action here and we're going to have an amphibious landing and bring back some uh, flexibility and fluidity uh, to the battlefield. And uh, we have the uh, Incheon landing, which, uh, you know, we didn't talk about the command relationships that are set up here when the, when the war begins. And of course, MacArthur had been in Japan as supreme uh, commander of allied uh, the powers as the uh, supreme uh, agent of the occupation of Japan. And then also he was a commander of U.S. Uh, forces of uh, the uh, Far East. And then once the war starts and Truman uh, decides, well, all right, he's going to be uh, my commander in the field. And that's added to his, um, to his other responsibilities. So, uh, so MacArthur is supreme commander then of the uh, forces that are fighting in Korea with uh, General Walker as the 8th Army commander, but uh, for purposes of this chromite then, chromite operation, which is the landing in Incheon, MacArthur fights with the Joint Chiefs to agree to establish a 10th Corps, which will be made up of a Marine Division and an Army Division and land in what is really uh, an incredible operation. Can we come back, uh, yeah. uh, just maybe to take this chronologically, let's yeah. fill in just a little bit on MacArthur and the, uh, the command, and then uh, Pusan, and then uh, Inchon. Uh, on the Pusan perimeter, uh, my suggest to you, we've got a Leavenworth paper, which I think is listed in your syllabus by Glenn Robertson's counterattack on the Nakdong, which shows uh, just how tenuous that line is. When you, when you look at a map, it looks like a you know, fairly solid line down on the what's, uh, southeastern tip of Korea. It's not. It's a porous line. And Walker is constantly having to shift units around to fill that line in and to, and to hold it. And uh, Glenn's paper, uh, his Leavenworth paper, deals with that. These are available available to you free of charge and uh, uh, in a class you might ask one student to read it and uh, do a report or whatever you might not but uh, just as a suggestion that that paper is available free of charge it deals with the Pusan uh, perimeter and the actual fighting there is uh, and this may be something you want to exploit on the command front uh, I think you mentioned but keep in mind MacArthur is a UN commander as well I and mean, this is a UN coalition we passed the resolutions that make it a UN endeavor. MacArthur is the UN commander, but who's he answering to? 
not necessarily the Secretary General of the UN, he's answering to Harry Truman, up to a point. Uh, but uh, uh, the Americans are running the war, but it is a coalition. There are foreign troops that will fight under MacArthur uh, in Korea, and other nations will supply uh, 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 aid and of support. But uh, it's a UN effort, a UN flag, but the U.S. is calling the shots. So I just need to clarify that. You get to Pusan, uh, uh, where we finally stabilize the line, reinforce, and then MacArthur has his idea for the end run at Incheon. And, and something you can bring up with uh, your students, which will hit a good note, you know, today we deal a lot with the idea of force projection. I mean, that's a very important thing uh, that all of us have to look at, historians and our, our friends on the tactical and uh, operational side. And really, this the decision to buy time by Walton Walker, what he has to do is he has to buy enough time for America's ability to project forces to outweigh what the North Koreans can send south. I mean, that's the race. The race is, uh, can I get enough into Korea before I'm thrown off the peninsula to keep us there? Because if I can, we'll win. And that's the key. It's a race not of, of how fast do they get here or there, but how fast can I get ships to put American soldiers, tanks, and equipment yeah. into this little tiny perimeter which, I mean, at point, there are North Koreans within 15 and 16 miles of the port of Pusan. Mm -hmm. And it's how fast can I get this stuff there uh, to win? And, and, and actually, they do pretty well, even though, going back to the budgetary issues, what the Navy's spending their money on as carriers and not spending it on transports. Okay, force projection of the Army is not something that's seen as important. So that's not where they're spending a lot of money. But by the time that chromite comes off, the soldiers inside the Pusan perimeter are living far better than the North Korean soldiers on the outside of the Pusan perimeter. They're living on a couple of rice balls a day because they're at the, at the absolute far length of their logistics line. And our guys are eating fresh vegetables and fruit. Okay, They're eating as well as, as guys in Japan are by the time chromite's launched. So it's, this is a great study in force projection. Yeah. You know, if you want to focus in that direction, and, and you know, if that's something that you have looked at in, in repeated lessons, or you want to look at in repeated lessons, Korea is a great place to look at the well, power of force projection. Well, and and, and another, another thing to look at here with this uh, decision on, on chromite, if we're talking about a lesson in uh, command, uh, decision making and strategy and risk taking, how do you evaluate things? I mean, there are those who are saying these additional troops that are coming to, uh, from the States to uh, Japan and Korea should go into the Pusan perimeter because, as Larry had already said, this was, this was not a solid line. We didn't have complete uh, security, uh, complete assurance that this was going to uh, be able to hold. But MacArthur makes an assessment here uh, that, it, that Walker is going to be able to somehow hold it enough and that the two divisions that are coming, instead of being put into the Pusan perimeter, should be used in a stroke, a strategic stroke that will have a lot of risk, but it, in one uh, fell swoop then, it can dramatically alter the uh, military situation on the Korean Peninsula. And the JCS are nervous about it. <laughs> Lots of people are nervous about it. Mac MacArthur argues uh, strongly for it, and it works. Well, in fact, if you, if you get the idea that Mark, MacArthur just kind of figured this out as the perimeter was going on, uh, it's not really true. I mean, the, the records indicate that he starts talking about doing an action like Incheon very, very early. I mean, shortly after the invasion occurs, he already, with his staff in Japan, are starting to visualize this bold stroke to do, I mean, let, let's face what, what chromite really does for us. We've talked about the tanks that are being used by the North Koreans. If you've ever been to Korea, uh, you know, the general in the KMAG wasn't too far off. There's only so many places you can use them. And if you follow the battle calendar down, you'll see they follow the highway, the main highway that goes uh, Osan, Pyongyang, then down Taejeon, Taegu. I mean, that's where the battle is. So just following that, that uh, road down there. And he's going to cut that road. 
because if you cut that road up above at Seoul, and it goes right through Seoul, and you cut off the fuel supply to the North Korean tanks, they're going to wither up and die. And he starts thinking about that very, very early on. I've read one author who says that when he lands in Osan, or he lands in, uh, oh, it's north of Osan, uh, Suwon, when he first lands and he'll take a jeep up to look across the, the Yalu River, or look across the uh, Han River, Han River, that he, even then he turns to an aide and starts talking about a bold stroke coming from the ocean in the area of Seoul. So this is something that, that pops into Doug MacArthur's mind real early on. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about this road and you mentioned uh, Osan and then you said Pyongyang, I think maybe you were thinking oh, Pyongyang Tech. Pyong Tech. Pyong Tech. <laughs> Sorry, I was going north already. <laughs> One question you might ask the students regarding Inchon, and that is, is this an example of MacArthur's brilliance or is it just pure common sense? I mean, we've had officers come through here arguing both ways. You know, that uh, here you got the JCS, they, uh, they're inclined not to approve it. MacArthur's eloquence wins them over. There's a recent documentation that suggests that Truman sending some atomic bomb components out in that direction also helped the JCS go for it. Uh, but MacArthur uh, talks about the second hand of destiny ticking away and all of this, and he convinces them this is the thing to do. But is it that bold a maneuver? Is it that uh, uh, unexceptional? Mao Zedong knew it was coming. He told Kim Il Sung, they'll hit you at Inchon. Kim Il Sung ignored the advice and paid the price. But uh, is it brilliance or just military common sense? You know, uh, uh, do the envelopment and cut them off. Yeah. Well, the uh, the aftermath of Inchon, of course, is that the uh, North Korean army that's down in the uh, southeast corner of the Korean Peninsula then has its logistics lines cut. And, uh, and then we know uh, that there's a breakout uh, from the Pusan perimeter link up. And by the end of September, <coughs> the uh, UN coalition is faced with the issue of uh, what to do now about uh, Korea, because the Korean army has basically been uh, destroyed, North Korean army has been destroyed. And um, there's the question of should we cross the uh, 30th parallel? Uh, the issue of war aims changing uh, uh, at this point when it looks as if, hey, we can accomplish a lot more, we can achieve a lot more than just returning to the uh, pre-war uh, situation. And so, uh, so we have a debate uh, in the UN, in the US, and uh, so on, in other places in Korea, uh, what to do. And uh, the decision is made then to, to go for it. And I think that debate is, is, is meaningless yeah. uh, because uh, Sigmund Rhee's going north. <laughs> you know, I don't care what anybody else says, Sigmund Rhee's going north. <laughs> so uh, he's either going by himself or he's going with us. And at this yeah. point, MacArthur argues and Truman agrees that if he's going, we better go with him. Yeah. Because one way or the other, He's going there, north. And there are, excuse me, there are uh, compelling reasons to do it. Uh, one point to make, uh, and, and again, I, we see this not only as giving you suggestions, but also information you might not have in the readings. Uh, as the Foreign Relations Series uh, documents in there make clear, uh, American policymakers uh, within uh, an interagency, actually, State Department, Defense Department, CIA, uh, the second echelon, right below the secretaries, they're uh, talking in July of 1950 about when we get to the 38th, what are we going to do? Uh, it's not a question of if we get to the 38th, it's always when we get to the 38th. They're assuming that Pusan perimeter will hold and ultimately will push them back. And the question becomes, do we cross the 38th? As Jim said, Sigmund Rhee's already decided that. He's going north. He's got the wherewithal to do it now. The question is, will the UN go with him? Will the US go with him? And uh, one thing you might do is ask your students, you know, if you're the commander in chief, if you were MacArthur, what recommendation would you make? If you're Truman, what decision will you make? And on what basis? Would you go north or not? So as, as Jim said, there's, there's really not a heck of a lot of debate. All the reasons say go north. The only one that uh, 
causes some caution is if we go north, the Chinese and the Soviets might intervene. And, and that causes some real consternation, but not enough to override these other concerns. Yeah. And, and a comment on that issue of Chinese intervention. I mean, you know, as we look back, we know that's what is what actually occurs. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, the issue is, well, how could we have known? Well, the fact is that we could have known because Mao Zedong does, in fact, tell that we don't have direct relations, diplomatic relations, but he, in fact, tells, who's it, Indian? The Indians. The Indian ambassador that if the, North, if the Koreans come north, that's one thing. I have no problem with that. But if the Americans come north, okay, basically he says that he'll have to take some action. And, again, I take that back to our... Uh, continuing, uh, we continue to underestimate Asian uh, hmm. enemies, okay? And we didn't believe he'd do it, or he couldn't do it without us knowing it was coming, all right? The fact of the matter was, he was already moving troops towards the border. By the time we hit the 38th, yeah. he's already got He's there in July. So, I mean, he's ready to go much earlier than we would start looking for him. Mm -hmm. But, you, you know, I agree, there is no other option. You go north at this point and you uh, you know if you believe Mao Zedong then you try to bluff him out of coming you know with nuclear weapons or whatever you try to bluff him with but we did have uh, a semblance of a warning that the Chinese would come across uh, Mao was rather open about that well that's right and um, and also you know in terms of looking uh, for the for what's going to happen if we cross uh, the 30th parallel I think this concern about uh, Chinese intervention or Soviet intervention is there uh, and in a sense um, the JCS does give uh, uh, MacArthur some guidance as to what to do uh, if there is a uh, Chinese intervention or, or a Soviet intervention we're supposed to uh, stop uh, you know moving north uh, which in a sense is a rule of engagement then uh, that we're now fighting uh, this this war under, uh, and uh, also Truman, as he's making his decision as the and looking at, towards the end of the war, uh, he flies to uh, Wake Island and meets with uh, MacArthur and uh, asks MacArthur about this uh, possibility. Well, what what's going to happen if the Chinese come? MacArthur says, "Well, don't worry about it. Uh, they're not going to come." Uh, I think for some of the reasons that uh, you know, Colonel Martin has mentioned, uh, well, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, they've just uh, had a long, bloody civil war. They, they need the time for economic reconstruction. Uh, it would, you know, we've got overwhelming firepower. They don't have the army that we have. So why would they want to get in there and lose? Uh, which is what MacArthur would, it says uh, to Truman, that will, that will happen. If the Chinese come in, we'll beat them. So, we, so don't worry about it. And, and the closest come, thing, and if they come, hey, we win. And the closest thing you've got to an Asian expert in the military is Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He spent his whole life there. He spent the last 17 yeah. years there. You know, yeah. and one point I'd like to make, because I know we're going to have to wrap this up here real shortly. Yeah. But, you know, most we, we see 50 to 53 for the dates on this thing. Yeah. Everything we've talked about here is within a year. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, we have this war goes three years in length, but most students only study the first year of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the drive to the perimeter, back to the Yalu, back to Seoul. That's what is mainly studied. There's two more years of virtual trench warfare, okay, stagnated on a line while they're busy doing uh, their thing at Panmunjom, trying to come up with a treaty. All right. So I mean, that's you might make that point to your students. Most of them only see the Korean War as what we've talked about through through Chinese intervention. Yeah. Well, that's right. And when, and when the Chinese intervene, then uh, you know MacArthur starts his uh, end the war offensive. Uh, 25 uh, November, 24 November, the Chinese intervene and MacArthur surprised and um, the Eighth Army is defeated, pushed out of North Korea and uh, you know it's, it's a disaster. Uh, that's the only way you can describe it. And General Walker's killed uh, in an automobile accident north of Seoul. We get Ridgeway in there. The Eighth Army is withdrawing south of Seoul when the uh, Chinese launched their uh, New Year's offensive, 
and uh, things look bad. MacArthur has gone from uh, the, the optimist who feels that the Chinese can't do anything to the pessimist who feels that the Chinese are going to drive the UN uh, army off the Korean Peninsula, and he starts talking about all kinds of things that uh, um, use of the A-bomb and, and what's going to happen if we have to withdraw from Korea and, and things. And, and the JCS are getting worried about his state of mind. Truman's worried about his state of mind. And then when Ridgeway has some success uh, at the end of January and, and so on and, and uh, goes back, recaptures Seoul, and, uh, and, and Truman then is starting to think about, well, maybe we can make a deal. But MacArthur, uh, you know, kind of sabotages his effort there, and uh, we end up then with the relief of MacArthur, which is, I mean, you know, we've, we've kind of we've spent an awful lot of time talking about the uh, this early period of the war, which is uh, extremely important, extremely interesting, and then all of a sudden here you got the middle of April, 1951, the relief of MacArthur, which again is a, it, it's a tremendous topic, uh, you know, oh, yeah, for discussion. You, you could do a whole class on dealing with yeah. uh, is MacArthur right or is he wrong? Yeah. And that has to do with a basic tenet of American military service and that's who's in charge the civilians right. of the military. Yeah, and that, that, that's a critical point. Uh, uh, you can debate the merits of the Europe first policy of Truman. Uh, who at one point uh, tells MacArthur that the, the rest of the divisions we're putting together, they're going to Europe to beef up NATO, which is a paper organization. Uh, you're going to have to fight the war with what you've got, which MacArthur doesn't want to hear. Uh, <clears throat> but to us, to the Truman administration, Europe was the critical uh, point of the Cold War, not the Far East. Uh, MacArthur, on the other hand, of course, is fighting in the Far East and sees everything uh, from that narrower perspective. You can debate who's right or wrong in that, but the issue is uh, MacArthur publicly made his views known after he had been told not to, and uh, that's insubordination, and for that you get relieved. But in the time left, very quickly, uh, there are some implications of all of this uh, when you look at the Korean War. First of all, uh, constraints, or containment rather, is expanded to Asia. Secondly, the budget, the ceiling on the budget is lifted. It goes up to 50 billion. Eisenhower will put a clamp back on it, and that's a story of the 50s. Uh, the Army's hurting once again in the 50s, but for a brief moment, everybody gets well, and uh, everybody, each service is getting what it needs to fight. And then I think one of the main things to come out of Korea is a theory of limited war, which did not exist before. And that is, what do you do when you have to fight for the reasons we stated earlier, but you can't go all the way to a superpower confrontation for fear of the Soviets uh, nuking New York. They've got enough bombs to do that. Uh, and the answer is, you fight the limited war. What is the limited war theory? You send enough, you use enough military force to convince the other side they can't win militarily and they need to negotiate. Well, a lot of people are going to die to get that political negotiation. MacArthur's view is there's no substitute for victory. Harry Truman is essentially saying, yes, there is a political settlement, but one based upon our convincing the other side through the loss of our lives and our sacrifice that they cannot win. And this limited war theory, which is written after Korea, will become the basis for getting us into Vietnam. So here we are, uh, lesson 13, limited war, Korea. And uh, we hope these uh, points that have been raised here by, by the three of us will help you as you put your own lesson together. As, you, as we said, you know, preparedness, uh, the conduct of operations, uh, civil military relations, relief of MacArthur, the uh, conduct of the, uh, the war, strategic surprise, why do we underestimate the enemy? There are all kinds of issues that are raised here, and uh, so many of them are worthy of uh, a, a deeper discussion than you're going to have time for.